and I'm a Stanford ILL alum and corporate counsel at Amherst Bank. As part of the Brazil and Silicon Valley team, I'm honored to introduce you to our next session, Embracing Disruption, How Large Financial Institutions Are Preparing for the Future. This panel aims to discuss ways in which large financial institutions can prepare for the future, applying innovative technologies to their businesses and leveraging the technology being developed by fintech startups. For this discussion, we'll have Bina Calola and Roberto Salucci, moderated, moderated by Veronica Serra. Bina Calola has a long career at Bank of America Merrill Lynch and is currently the Managing Director in Global Banking and Markets, Financial Technology Innovation and Investments. In her role, she identifies technology trends and innovation opportunities. She was ranked in Institutional Investors 2016 FinTech Finance 35, which turns a spotlight on the financiers who fund FinTech innovation. Roberto Salucci is the CEO of BTG Pacual and a member of the Board of Directors. He joined the bank in 1994. Mr. Salucci is also a member of the Board of Directors of Febraban, the Brazilian Banking Association, Mercado Livre, and Banco Pan. He holds a degree in economics with specializations in finance and marketing from the Wharton School of the University of Pennsylvania. Veronica Serra is the founding partner of Pacific Investments and Innova Capital Fund. She has 20 years of experience making private and growth equity investments in the U.S. and Latin America, and she's an active mentor of students and entrepreneurs. She's board member of ClearSale, Mobile, Endeavor Global, among others. She graduated from law at the University of Sao Paulo and Harvard Business School class of 1997, where she serves in the board. Please join me in welcoming Vina Calola, Roberto Salucci, and Veronica Serra. Welcome, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. Vina and Roberto. Um, why don't we start? We're, we're talking today about embracing disruption in the financial services industry. Uh, both of you, of you come from very large institutions, you know, Bank of America and BTG Pactual. Um, why don't we start, uh, Vina, why don't you run us through what are the major trends uh, in your industry, what's going on? Where's the change coming from? Um, and what are your thoughts on uh, the future of your industry in terms of how it serves its customers? So I would start with it's coming from everywhere. There isn't anything that's not changing. So if I take the first big change and momentum and we think about consumer behavior. Fundamentally, how do people behave now that you've got mobile, mobile apps, right? So we take 2007 and we see the ex escalation of applications. Take that now into the corporate institutional world and what are the expectations? At the same time, we have a cost of compute and the speed of compute that has come down so substantially that we trade in milliseconds to nanoseconds which is quite incredible when you think about the, the uh, capabilities that there are out there. Then we have another dynamic of open source. So we're at Stanford. Stanford's NLP libraries on natural language processing are some of the most widely utilized libraries in the space of contract intelligence, on unstructured data to structured data. And what's really incredible is the commercialization that sits on top of all of that. So there's really not an area that I would say isn't being um, improved, turned around, that um, is, there's a lot of new. But I think that all of these are opportunities if we embrace them. And so we're really thinking about, in many ways, you have to back into impact. And there are lots of great ideas out there, but when you sit in a seat where you know you have limited capacity, you have limited bandwidth, 
you have to prioritize and understand first who, who are you trying to um, serve. So you're trying to serve your external clients, you're trying to serve your workforce, and you're trying to serve your shareholders in thinking about your operational efficiencies, for example, and position to stay competitive. So a lot going on, but exciting. That's great. So there was a recent survey on Fortune 1000 executives where 80% of them feared that their firms would be at risk for disruption and displacement. Um, Roberto, why don't you tell us uh, your customers, which are big corporations in, in Brazil and, and Latin America and elsewhere, uh, how are you tackling their fear for disruption uh, in terms of the services you're providing to them? How are you making them, you know, more prepared um, for this market? Well, for us, I think in our traditional business, clearly there are chances for disruption, but a bit of the trends that uh, Bina talked about are actually opportunities. So if you look at, let's just talk about investment banking in general, and then we can go to our specific situation in Brazil. So if we don't, if we think that capital markets will continue the same in 10 years time, as it has been for the last 30 years, I think we'll probably be wrong. So I don't know if you guys saw this, but we were the first investment bank to issue an STO, a securitized token offering. Basically using blockchain and Ethereum to securitize the real estate portfolio of Brazil. Is this gonna be capital markets of the future? We're not sure. But we had to go throughout the, through the process, which was not as easy as expected, and now we're having interactions with the regulator to see that if maybe this is an option to democratize uh, capital markets. If we're not gonna use that analytics and the whole digital experience to improve the experience of our wealth management clients, we will not have a wealth management business. If we do not take, there are three big trends happening in Brazil, right? Remembering all of you guys know that Brazil is a very concentrated market, Five banks control 80% of assets, 90% of deposits, only 10% of investments are outside of the big retail banks. So you have the conjunction of a regulator that's fostering competition. And this is very important, so I'm gonna give an example. Today, you can do digital onboarding. So, all of a sudden, you are regulatory allowed to have retail, distri retail digital distribution, which was not possible before because you had to look at the person physically to do the onboarding. So, not only, so you have a, a regulator that's fostering competition, you have all these technologies. Five years ago, I felt like the sales guy at the Magazine Luisa video that Fred just showed, right? I thought that uh, uh, technology was gonna put me, uh, have to send me over, I have to retire. So then we, one day we sat down and we said, you know what guys? Let's stop fearing it and let's try to learn it. And that's what we've been doing. So, as you said, cloud computing, data analytics, performance marketing, online to offline conversion, the, the whole digital user experience allows us to all of a sudden open every week, every week, more accounts than we've had our whole life. We used to service clients that only had above 10 million reais. And now we have thousands and thousands and thousands of clients which have an average ticket of a bit of over 100,000. And this is, this is then causing a third trend, which I consider a macro trend in Brazil, which is interest rates are going to new levels. And hopefully our macro situation will, will continue with that. So investors all of a sudden realize that they need duration, credit, and equity exposure in their portfolios. And they realize that they don't have competitive pricing or good advice. And in Brazil, only 10% of the invested assets are outside of the five big retail banks. So you put all this together, and there's an opportunity for us to get our traditional business, which will be disrupted, and which we have to use to, to improve customer experience. And then all of a sudden, we learned in the last five years that we can have a retail distribution. It started with individuals, now we realize it can also happen to SMEs, and so on and so forth. And for us, this is a huge challenge in our traditional 
businesses with a huge opportunity in the businesses that we were not before. So you talked a lot of, about lots of different things. One that caught my attention is that with technology, uh, banks that are serving very large corporate customers and that used to ignore the SMEs or the you know, customers that weren't uh, reaching a certain amount of transactions uh, with the bank in terms of size are now suddenly cheaper to do business with. Um, how, how is that changing in terms of the focus of the bank? Because it seems that you're now covering areas that you weren't covering before. You have so many new initiatives. Uh, are you segmenting to go into new audiences? Are you doing what um, was spoken about this morning, which is testing the ground to see what works and what doesn't, and maybe going into these new lines of businesses? Um, I, I'm very happy. Uh, I, was, I was telling one of, one of the, the persons here before that everything that we've been doing for so long, and I used to be so criticized for, that they thought that we were, oh, you, know, you need to improve your management. It's a bit chaotic. And now the catch word is K-order. You need organized chaos. And so that's what we've always had. And you need to allow for freedom for experimentation, which we've always had. So, and also, we didn't have consensus on how to do it, which I, I realized that, well, that's a good, good thing. Today I realized that. Because some people thought that we should spin everything off, different brand, different office, and we thought that, no, we should use what we have, use the, the aspirational brand we have, do it together, but segment it because as in anything where you have more than 200 people, it will be people who will feel bothered by it. They need to protect the initiative and be like the, the big football guys protecting the running back so that it can foster, you have to support it. So what we did is we isolated it, we, when we, let's, let's use the, the investment part as the, as the example. So we set it up as a startup. So we put the guys from onboarding, IT, ops, marketing, serving clients, everybody in the same Like group. a mixed team with different skill mixed sets. Team. We put them sitting all together. Next thing we had to do, do we have the right talent? And clearly, if we were gonna continue hiring the same way we hired the previous 30 years, we would not have to have the right talent. So we had to create an environment in the bank where people who did not dress like investment bank bankers felt comfortable. So we had to compete for computer engineers with the gaming companies. We had to com compete for performance marketing with the ad agencies. With the data analytics, we had to make sure that we were, were recruiting the best. And I think we've been very successful in that such that you go to the ninth floor and now Fada has all the graffitis on the wall, you have people... The uh, that, you, you definitely don't want them reaching the clients which will IPO, but clearly the, the digital clients are being serviced. And uh, in that way we were able to, in my view, maximize everything. Maximize the brand, the execution, and the synergies, because there are tons. Just imagine if you have to do a whole new back office system. It would take twice as long. So, uh, Bina, in a bank as large as Bank of America, working with innovation, uh, the impact you can have in an organization of that size is tremendous. Could you, could you share with us one or two cases of ideas and opportunities that you have spotted and implemented in the bank and the impact it has had? Yes, we have some really live uh, things going on, which I'll, I'll talk about. Um, but I think it's interesting in the change around innovation transformation is being reactive versus being offensive. And I think we've gone very much on the offensive side. And I think that's really, really important because you have to know your organization, who you are, and, and where you can get your best opportunities. So we think data and the amount of data we sit on across the entirety of the bank is absolutely incredible. And there's an opportunity to leverage that to be better ourselves to make our own um, clients' lives better as well, right, and how we service them. So we've created a data and innovation group, of which I'm sitting under on the tech innovation. And we're thinking about, first, our unstructured data and building an architecture, which is kind of different from how we think about it. We used to let groups and bodies kind of on their own figure out how and what data sets they're going to use, how do you actually manage that. 
But if you start to enable business analysts to actually come up with ideas, test the thesis, and not just wait for a tech developer or a quant, and actually the SME is enabled to actually test the data, you really empower the broader right, workforce to think differently and to bring their clients different ideas. So the data architecture stack is something that we're building right now. Within that stack, if you asked me to build that stack two years ago, the way each stack looks would look very different. There would be a lot of builds, a little bit stuck, maybe now legal compliance won't let us. But if you think about the technologies that are now out there, even from a data governance encryption, um, coming up with a dummy data set, um, off of a real data set, we're looking to the outside to help us in that entire architecture. The other one that's super exciting and people are not talking about as much is unstructured data. And it's because this technology evolution is just happening. And so what does that mean? That means actually taking text and for the machine to be able to actually process, extract inferences, et cetera, right? It's not quite at the human brain, but the accuracy level is quite high. You know, you can get to 80-85%, that is really quite good. So we're also thinking about everything on natural language processor, processing from building a platform front to back. When we take unstructured data, so optical character recognition, natural language process tools, a cohesive data storage platform that you say process once, leverage many. Um, enables a lot of people to not have to fund it each time. And so those are two really big initiatives that lay across all of global banking and markets. And so the way we've centralized, we're thinking tool sets, kits, platforms, and then you come and you layer, right, whatever application you want on top. And then you layer you and you can use it for whatever use case. That's an enablement. So do the clients already do they plug into uh, your system? How are the clients um, seeing those the result of these innovative initiatives that you're having in the bank? So the clients will not directly plug in. What will happen with the unstructured data side is that we still have we're, we're in the process. It, that kind of data that we might make available would have to be masked. We have to be really careful on data. It's not just from, a, you know, regulation was mentioned many times, but it's the trust and faith of our clients as well on how we use our own data, their data, and, and what we do with that. And I think there's quite a sensitivity around that. So it's easy to say just use data. It's really hard to implement. Um, but on the, the ideation and the servicing side, that's the difference in um, what they, they will see, what they're getting from us. Okay, great. So could we talk a little bit about talent? So all of these changes, um, you know, you have to be attracting the most talented people um, to be able to think about the issues and, and work on them and implement them. How uh, are both of you competing with the top tech firms um, in terms of attracting these talents? Because the young kids graduating maybe from Stanford or even from other top schools uh, it's hard to think today that if, you know, if Google is coming in or Palantir, other companies, how do you sell on them that it's more interesting to come to Bank of America or to BTG? Um, and in that, I would love to hear about ownership and also the entrepreneurial spirit that you guys can uh, allow within your organization in order to, to attract them. Sure, I'm happy to, to start. So, and it's not just the tech companies we're competing against. We're competing against hedge funds. I mean, everybody is searching for all of this tech talent. You know, everything from a data scientist um, to somebody who understands market structure, um, uh, market structure to somebody who can code in Python, right? And so, you know, we really thought about our work environment. We hired Workbench to actually recreate our trading floors, and we're doing stack by stack, including in investment banking. And, it is amazing how an open culture, free coffee, food, et cetera, really brings people together having a discussion. Um, but we are trying to enable people to be able to see that we are going to make data, for example, easier uh, for them to play with um, and, and come up with great ideas versus sitting up on your hands waiting for tech for five months to build something so that their workflow is going to look different. Um, the other is that we, we remind people that we're here to bring you along a journey. 
and it's not a it one two year but we actually want you to be part of building the solutions and so you know we, we hope that people want to work in a, our environment but i think something that's critical and i just want to point this out because i don't know that this has been addressed is that particularly on the bank side our uh, employment and our policies are absolutely incredible so if you're a young woman you should really be thinking about um, what policies and um, are out there, and the bank does an incredible amount on disabilities. Everything that you can imagine a, a Google or a big tech company offers, we do as well. And I don't think that's fully comprehended, that you are a total person, and that's not how young people see a bank. And so we have to be better in helping people understand what it means to bring every type of talent and individual and to be a whole person where you are. I think we divide it into three parts. The first is to have a very clear mission and vision, right? People that come to work with us, with us understand that we are there to help clients in their success. And with that, help the country's success. And I think that's really something that really allows you to bring people to, to a dream, especially to the, nowadays when the youngsters always want to make sure that they have a purpose, to always be sharing your client's success or sharing their growth makes it much easier for us. The second is the environment, to have a very, an environment where, and the benchmark we use is, I would be very happy for anybody of my family to work there because I know they will be, have a great environment, great support, great professional development, and they can thrive. But most important, it's something that's been working for us for over 30 years. Even though we're a listed company, we decided to keep the partnership model. So the partners of the, of the TG still own 85% of the equity. And we basically want people, not people who want a job, but people who want a project of life, who want to become owners of the bank. And they see the examples that happened to me, that happened to all of my partners that are here. I mean, none of us were from family of bankers. We all came in in the back office. We all worked, delivered, started as small partners, grew, and so people understand that they can be entrepreneurs in the financial sector where they're able to disrupt from not such a I think we have the benefit of size. In Brazil, we're 1,200 people. So we still know everybody's name. But I think it's different for, um, in your case. And I think this is a huge benefit for us. But it's always making sure that we attract people who want to become owners of the business. So uh, the banking sector overall uh is not uh, sort of the top ranked um, industry in terms of being seen as having a, a, a strong purpose. Uh, you know, when we read a lot about purpose um, it, it, and, and social impact and doing good, banks are not way at the top. Um, and a lot of the contacts that have been created um, are trying to fix a pain point, and most of the, the pain points are customers you know, not having transparency, um, not having access to um, best rates or to the best service. How are you tackling that? If the new generation wants to work for companies that also do good and not just uh, make profits, how are you positioning yourself and, and how do you sell on this new generation, which is not only um, generating talents that you want to hire, but also clients that you will serve? You know, we serve so many different constituents and so many um, different um, uh, economic and wealth levels and needs, you know, and so we, we really say that, you know, we're, we are about our clients and their financial wellness and, and their health. You know, I think there is, uh, there's a lot of information that's not out there on how much we actually do for the, the environment, how much we fund on uh, renewables, on energy. There's a lot of things that we get behind as institutions. I think we, we do a poor job in highlighting a lot of what's out there. Um, yes, there is a certain amount of financial risk that regulators aren't going to allow us to take on the underwriting side. And whether we think that that's completely um, right or wrong, you know, we are restricted on um, what we can completely do. On the other hand, I actually think there's a wonderful dynamic out there 
we're thinking about how do you bring payments to um, places in Africa, for example, through mobile. I think that's absolutely fabulous. I think there is room for a lot of different ways. We look to the outside for our last mile in helping corporates and others make payments right to an individual who did a job for them in another country that we don't have infrastructure. So, you know, I, I, I just think that there's a lack of understanding of everything that banks do and also assuming that there's only room for one when there's room for many um, and many to enable. And so we have to play in the box that we're given by regulators. We have to be mindful of that because people don't want to put certain systemic risk out there. But we can engage and adopt certain technologies to help more people. And I think that's a lot of what we are trying to do. But if you actually look at how much we, we are funding out there, that's equally as important of what we do in our communities to help people build homes, what we do for our military, everybody. It's a lot of constituents to please. I think for us, is in our traditional businesses, uh, they work normal as they always have, but in the new business, businesses that we're doing, everybody loves to be the challenger. And I think in that sense, we're in a unique position because we're at the same time the sixth largest bank, but we have no retail business or have no retail business. So people see us as the challenger, as the one who can offer the, be the better service, the, be the fairly priced product. And the, the, going back just to investments, the value proposition is just very compelling. Every retail investor can now access the same products, the same services at the same price that was only available to multi-millionaires. So that's a very, very compelling value proposition which allows us to attract the, the different kind of talents that we traditionally att attracted. Um, can we talk a little bit about regulation? Um, we know that, at least in Brazil, the regulators have been you know, uh, adapting fairly quickly to, to uh, allowing fintechs to have a better chance at competing with, with a highly concentrated market. Um, what would you like to see in terms of regulators approving, and you could say maybe one or two things in that front, um, that are not there and that are holding you from doing more? If you could just give practical examples of what those could be. Um, so I think some of the regulators could, who, who really do want to foster innovation could actually give transparency on what they think is enforceable, for example, around blockchain. There isn't enough clarity yet around that. So people are um, hesitant to be in a public blockchain where they don't know exactly what that means. So clarity, guidance, you know, you think you, you don't want them to say as much, but you do. These are all new technologies. I think that data on um, privacy is another one where I think we're going in opposite directions of transparency around data, yet the privacy regulations globally are getting much more stringent. So it's two very um, polarized dynamics of where technology is on transparency and where regulation is. And I think we have to start marrying the reality of technology with the rules and regulations um, to the reality. Um, and I think we still have some, you know, um, antiquated ways of looking at this. Anything specific on Brazil's regulation that you would want to see? Three very specific. Open banking as soon as possible. Peer-to-peer 24-7 -peer payments as soon as possible. And for us to get rid of uh, some bureaucratic restrictions of exclusivity for financial advisors, which only allows that competition does not foster. Wonderful. Um, could we dive into, so I'm going to look at a couple of questions from the audience. Um, one is, which is something that uh, always comes through, uh, if one of you could tell me what are your thoughts on cryptocurrency in, in terms of um, how it can disrupt traditional banking? Um, maybe you, Bina, because you're uh, looking at it more globally, I think cryptocurrency is still somewhat limited in Brazil. We haven't seen a lot of it there. Yeah, I'm just saying from the Bank of America standpoint, we're, um, we're not at all active in it right now. Not at all, you no. said. Okay. That says a lot. <laughs> I'm skeptical about cryptocurrency as a, as a store of value or as transaction because it's too volatile. But I really think that we should not dismiss blockchain mm -hmm. and tokenization as a way to distribute assets. 
things probably that's probably the way that I would see them go. Uh, one more question here. Um, how do you deal with the lower margins of the lower margins that the fintech have been setting uh, to the market? Is it sustainable? So how is that pressuring uh, your own margins when you look at your business? You know, I'll actually um, say if you actually could see some of the numbers, a lot of them are, um, a lot of the food techs are, are loss making, and when they actually try and service clients or client acquisitions, it's really, really high. So that thin margin doesn't really allow them to do very much beyond something very simple in either a direct distribution channel. For us, we, you know, we, we're not playing against anybody else's margin. We have to play in the world we operate in. How can we bring our efficiencies, operation costs down? What can we do on automation? That's a really big one for us. How can we think about um, completely replacing systems with a whole new way of doing business? How do we think about um, inefficiencies? And so I think we look at it a little bit differently from like more of an inside and an outside perspective because we're not going to get rid of the complexity that all of our different clients bring us and all of the regulation and the layers that we have. But there, there is a lot of room for us to be better. And that's what we're excited about. So I have a very different question. If both of you were to, let's uh, put an imaginary world, if both of you were to work for a completely different business, uh, in the technology world, where would you go to and why? Probably, I'd probably say education and ed tech. But I think really that you can have a huge empowerment in that. And it's an area where personally I have a lot of interest. <laughs> Mine would be very much, I'm, I'm passionate about sort of thinking about health and wellness through a different lens of agriculture. And if we think about a lot of problems, you know, in the U.S. and other places in the world and where we're going with mental health and diabetes and heart disease, I think there is a different way to bring agriculture to a new place and really bring wellness back. Um, and really fight a lot of the, the, the bad diseases and disabilities that we have that do not have to be there. So it would have nothing to do with the tech per se, um, but technology would be a big part of it. So one of, one of the curiosities about this is that a lot of times when you talk to leaders about large businesses, um, they sometimes have very special connections to completely different areas. Um, in that respect, um, how are you going into areas that are not necessarily in your own industry and serving um, those industries to, to make a change by empowering them with, with finance? Uh, for example, Brazil has a huge agriculture um, uh, economy. Uh, and you know I, I think that there's tremendous opportunities in terms of financing, using a lot of technology to finance um, in different ways, um, these um, these farm owners um, uh, with you know credit, with uh, financing um, in their different operations, with uh, using data, etc. How are you looking at these sectors which are non-obvious um, and go instead of just um, looking at your own business and improving internal processes or? reacting, how are you looking at businesses where they're not being served and they're just there, either um, in industries that are large and unserved or in sectors that are just behind? So something I'm really proud of um, is all that we're doing around women globally, right? And how do we empower women in communities? How do we empower them to start their own businesses? How do we um, either sponsor them through funding or teaching them how do we actually build communities. And I think that women and which women entrepreneurs have been absolutely underserved by the, the capital markets community from you know venture capital all the way through to banks. And so we do an incredible amount um, in that space globally. And I think that 
to me, that's just something I'm really passionate about, and I know a lot of leaders around me are very passionate about that, but it does take a group that is, you know, right, half the population of us, um, and really empowers them because it makes, you know, family lives better, it, it grows communities, and that's really important, and that grows economies. And I think we forget that, particularly in the United States, women control a good portion of the spend. That's a great subject. So, Roberto, uh, we can see even by the audience that, you know, we have probably had like two-thirds to 70% of men here attending the conference. Um, and finance is typically a segment where there's high concentration of men. How is BTG um, working on its diversity and how many women partners do you have at the bank? So, I will not run away from your question, even though I'm a minority on the stage. But, uh, <laughs> That's a good one. But just on your, on your other topic, uh, we have been taking a different approach. Uh, as you said, maybe agriculture has the opportunity. But we don't know. example. Yeah, but we're not sure if they're ready for the digital distribution. So what we've been trying to do is to have a, as dense as we can combination of digital real estate assets with that analytics then telling us what customers want and then using our manufacturing capability to deliver to them digitally. So I think we've been taking a different approach of it. instead of us trying to come up, we're really trying to observe using these digital assets what they're interested in. On your second question, uh, we, we do have a lack of women interested in the financial sector, and there is some, in my view, wrong view of what is the financial sector and what is VTG. So we roughly now probably have around, I would say 13% of our, of our partners are women. Uh, this is probably from zero or six or five years ago, so they have been increasing. But we also need to increase and throughout the whole spectrum. So we have uh, our, our actually our, our women partners have created a mentoring program in the universities to encourage women to go into the financial sector and to BTG Pact to all, uh, taking away some of the myths that they have about the market. What about in the board on the leadership level? How many women in your board? On the board, currently none, but uh, yeah, none. Okay. Um, we just added some. So we have. A what about Bank of America? We have five, which is an incredible number. I mean, it really changes the, the dynamics of the conversation. And having served on, you know, about 10 private company boards where I was the only woman and have been tech on these boards with all of my peers, I'm now proud to say that at least a few of them, there is at least, you know, two to three of us. Um, so it's a great shift, but it does change the dialogue and it's really critical and important. Um, could we talk a little bit about um, products? So what are um, some products that you guys have sort of in the oven that are cooking that could really change um, sort of the dynamics of, of, if you can talk about it, but um, that can change the way you do business? So this question comes from, uh, in the end of the year I met with some entrepreneurs that we invest in and we said, okay, what would you kill within your business uh, by replacing it with something new and better? Um, so is there anything that you would not do going forward because you want to replace it for something incredibly better? And what would that be? Uh, and that's more talking about reinventing um, yourselves on the product side. Uh, if you can talk about some of that innovation, it would be wonderful. I, I want to cover more practical cases so people can see what is being done in real life. I think your first question is, um, what are we cooking? I think it's inevitable that at some point in the next 12 to 18 months we'll have to offer a transactional platform. I mean, it's going to be part of the service offering for individuals who are investors or for SMEs that uh, will be transacting with us. And for us, that's a huge change, right? And so it's really, so they will transact with you directly through yeah, it's the basically platform. basically getting into payments and to transfers and things that, if you ask me, even five years ago, I would say that we would never get into that. But so this the whole same technological way, this revolution has, has allowed us to, to So develop. the same 
sorry, the same way individuals today, they do their online banking, you think the corporations will be doing the same in a much bigger way. Yeah, and, my, and we have a view at the bank that the banking concentration in Brazil will reduce its contract. The combination of independent distribution uh, has a, will, will allow for new companies to, to specialize themselves. So you will have new, let's say, credit specialty, specialty companies. And the whole cost of the technological revolution will also allow for new banks to be offering <coughs> services. And we're seeing that. And in our view, it's a matter of time that you will have a much more fragmented market. So you have to be very good at what you do, because if not, somebody smaller than you will be very good at that. And, uh, and the companies will, will, will have the chance to always be picking their service providers. Mina, um, could you talk a little bit about artificial intelligence? Today, AI is a buzzword. Everybody talks about it. Not, not everybody's doing it um, uh, in the same way, but Bank of America, as big as it is, um, I would love to know what your view on that is. Yeah, so AI is very broad, um, so I'm going to distill it down to a, a few specific things around machine learning. We sit being, you know, the subject matter expert with a lot of data, and we are getting um, involved and partnering with a lot of companies who've built a lot of that deep learning, machine learning um, toolkit and, and tools. And sometimes, you know, they come in and they smile and they do their demo and they then smile and we smile back and we're, oh yeah, I got it. You know, you're looking for the use case for your tool, right? Um, but I think what's really critical in machine learning is that ability where we have so much variation in our data or information or contracts, whatever it might be, that we want to mine for intelligence. And that without that deep learning, it's absolutely impossible to take a rules-based approach and really extract that relevant information and do the analytics. And so that's something that we're, we are super excited about to really think about um, all of the transaction data flow we're sitting on, how do we think about things that are more predicted to help our clients, what could be next, enabling our clients with their own data and analytics because you have to remember they don't all have teams who can do a lot of these analytics. So a more directed model, more information-based, data-driven, um, a lot of that is more machine learning predictive analytics side, and I think that that's going to be really interesting if we can actually take all those tools, help them as clients. The other thing that's not um, um, machine learning per se, AI, uh, but really, really important is when we think about APIs, which are really important for us to push in full information, it really allows clients to say, I have this overwhelming amount of data. It's coming in different content channels, it's coming in different formats, and I just can't reconcile this, so I'm just going to put it somewhere else. And instead of burning it in the sand, they can actually use tools to standardize and normalize, so we're, we're all agreeing kind of on the street to say, okay, we'll standardize and normalize that way that you want, so through a bot channel, whatever that might be. Um, the other kind of exciting around ML is thinking about the digital assistant, you know, so um, Tom Montag always says to us, well, if Alexa can do it, why can't Erica do it? And so we built Erica, which is our own tool, right? Um, and we're getting there, but some of it is homegrown, and we, we do that because otherwise the the model hits the cloud and open source libraries, and so privacy concerns on um, material non-public information, we have to be really mindful of that. But those things are very exciting. It can go into so many different directions. So I was at the CS earlier uh, this year, which is the Consumer Electronics Fair, seeing everything where Amazon is putting Alexa. So when you said you have Erica, I'm, I'm thinking, okay, maybe we'll say, Alexa, call Erica. <laughs> Ask her to pay <laughs> something. Uh, it's really an amazing um, world we live in of change. Um, Roberto, you guys opened kind of a uh, innovation hub attracting um, startups and innovative companies to come in the bank. Can you talk a little bit about that? If you're just funding them, if, if these companies have to be um, creating a service that integrates into your bank, what is the strategy there? And, and maybe you could talk about some of the companies that have been selected and, and what they're doing. Yeah, so uh, 
we set up Boost Lab, I would say probably 18 months ago. And the idea was that we wanted to channel all of the, the funding that we were give, giving to various uh, spread out entrepreneurial activities into a mentorship program in the, in, the, in the tech sector. We thought this would be a way that we could help these entrepreneurs and at the same time get energized and learn from them. And sincerely, it has been much better than any of our expectations. So we're in the third batch. Uh, when these, uh, when these uh, startups come, they don't need, they have, they have no contract with us or no commitment to accept an equity participation. We don't have any commitment to uh, give them an equity participation. The only commitment we have is to mentor them. And uh, we have a, a, a mentoring program that lasts six months. And different companies have different needs. We have a lot of, of, uh, of talented people there to help them. So they're people that are experts in IT, in marketing, in people, in management, in sales. And every company has, has some companies have problem, problems in their corporate structure. Uh, and the first program we, we did had an NPS score of 100. The second program had an NPS score of 98. Wow. And what happens is that these, I mean, everybody knows each other in the VC world, so they're all, they're all, let's say, telling each other to go. And we, so we had six in the first, six in the second, second now we have eight companies in the third, in the third uh, group. And of these companies, so these 12 companies, I would say we probably made uh, investments in three. We have five of them in which we're partnering to, to help them develop the business. And the rest were just good friends. And do they actually physically um, work in, in an office space? No. It's just mentoring, really. We're not giving off an office space. We're getting, we're getting mentoring. The program is mentoring. That's wonderful. Do you have at Bank of America any program uh, to support um, uh, young entrepreneurs or, or startups? Yeah. yeah, so we're involved with um, the New York FinTech Partnership. Um, we do quite a bit there. We, we took a different approach where we have what we call Lab GBAM, which is our Global Banking Markets Lab, and where we can actually put into pilot a lot more. So if I could do four, you know, two years ago, I'm doing over 25 right now, and, and we just finished the first quarter, which is absolutely incredible. I think the way we're also thinking about it is that a lot of these companies really need data, and they need some subject matter expertise, and so we, we lend a hand there. But we, um, we're, we, we definitely look to the outside. We are huge believers in that partnership and bringing on vendors for innovation. It's, it's like a great outsource to R&D. But by the time you could get there internally, it would just take you too long, and it would be three years out, and then it would have, uh, you know, um, surpassed you. We also do strategic investments, um, so we'll make, take minority stakes in, in a lot of companies where uh, we think they're strategic, and we'll sit on the board and we'll help guide the the companies. And often, you know, we're helping develop or co-develop platforms with other banks that are our peers and we think of them um, as, as our peers in solving problems, real problems that we have to come together to solve client problems. So um, we often innovate that way. That's great. Um, so as we're coming to a close, um, what I'd like to hear um, is maybe uh, from each of you just uh, as a closing remark, what change would you want to see in your segment? Um, as a whole, um, not just in your company, and if you have uh, a prediction for your segment of something that doesn't exist in that will, something different, like we won't have any money, it'll only be with cell phones. Do you have any sort of um, crazy prediction that you can share with us, uh, like that will happen in 10 years? I was about to say, actually, I wrote down that 10 years is really hard because there's so many things around us that will change. But in five years, we're going to be very much driven by all the things around us. I think there's going to be a lot more crowdsourcing that we're impacted by, directed models, um, where we might just be sitting in the middle of two people together and not be the balance sheet in the middle, that there's going to be this other evolution of um, a bit more agency rather than principle. And um, 
that might be okay. And we have to really think about what that means and what we're enabling. Yeah, exactly. Speaking about the financial segment specifically, I don't think in Brazil we will have an ecosystem like you have in China where you have one or two players which will dominate the market. I actually think we will, as I said previously, I think the, the big leading banks will be attacked from all sides. Uh, I think they're a big cheese and they'll become Swiss cheese. And uh, we will be surprised by the number of service providers and the different specialties and even some new players coming in different segments where I think in the end the consumer will benefit tremendously. So we won't be in a place where China is where you, if you have money you can't pay for things because people are, are only uh, able to pay with uh, their phones, with WeChat for example. We have to improve internet connectivity a lot, right? Mm -hmm. we're going to do it. Well, we hope that will happen. <laughs> I also think that when you think about um, client behavior and adoption, you go like everything mobile and you know living your life on your device. If you look at Asia, you go across to Europe and then you come to the U.S. We just have such, um, or you know, the Americas. We have something that's been institutionalized and you have to change. Whereas they're just jumping straight into something, and so that adoption rate helps that transformation be done by these companies. And I don't know that their expectation of privacy is quite the same across. The we didn't talk about privacy and the, the big leakages, but I think that's also a very big theme um, in our segment. So thank you very much, everybody. Um, congratulations for both of you for the results and impact you have in your own organizations, and um, we're ready to go. Thank you.